spend a year or two and work for free if you have to for a business that is growing in the industry that you want to be in. And that will be like going to four graduate schools. And and what will happen is if, if you are uh, the superstar person that you need to be to be successful in anything, you're going to be noticed right away, even if you're an intern. Within three months, they're going to be offering you a position in the business and you're going to rise up very quickly. My guest today is Mark Ford. Mark is the author of more than two dozen books and hundreds of essays on entrepreneurship, wealth building, economics, and copywriting. He's also written four books of poetry and a collection of short stories. And since 1993, he has been the chief growth strategist for Agora, a $500 million publisher of newsletters and books. I recently sat down with Mark and we talked about what holds most people back from being successful and what they can do to overcome those obstacles. All right, Mark, thanks so much for being on the show. I greatly appreciate it. I've been looking forward to it ever since we first met face-to-face about a couple of months ago in your office. So thank you so much. It's a pleasure, Charles. You know, when I walked into your office, I thought I made a mistake because I thought I was working in, I don't know if it was an art gallery. I don't know if it was a newsstand. I don't know if it was a library. I didn't know if it was, uh, you had a barista there with with all sorts of coffees and cigars. How did you set all that up? You know, it's it's like a man cave squared. <laughs> well, I, it, it is a bit of all of those things. Uh, I've always had a fantasy ever since I was a kid watching cartoons. There was a cartoon I remember where uh, a little mouse went into a little tent, but inside the tent, it was like a this big palace with all these crazy things. And I've been in, uh, for 30 years now, I've been in offices that are in uh, warehouses, but inside they're all filled with uh, things that uh, that I enjoy. Uh, I, oops, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to show you right now. You just in this office, there's an old grandfather clock, a friend of mine. There's a movie poster from a movie I made with Herschel Gordon Lewis. There's a, a, uh, a drawing of a mosque plan and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, yeah, it's it just making your environment fun. Yeah, well, you, your environment surely is fun. But it didn't start out fun, right? It started out, you were a, a kid growing up in Brooklyn. I think you were born in Brooklyn, right? Right, I think Park Slope Brooklyn, area. Right. Uh, to parents who are not entrepreneurs, not builders of empires, but probably more important, uh, professors, teachers of knowledge. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, how, how did you, what was the arc of your life? You, you started out uh, with, with, uh, with parents who were academics. You then mm-hmm. later in life joined the uh, Peace Corps. Right. And you ended up, uh, what is it, chief, uh, chief growth consultant for Agora, doing half a billion dollars, uh, living the life, zillions of philanth- philanthropic endeavors, and enjoying everything that you do. How did that start? How did that idea just get, get moving? Well, um, I did grow up. I spent the first six years in Brooklyn. And uh, and it was pretty, um, that was very working class, very Angeles Ashes type of environment, you know, a, a, a very mixed neighborhood. The kids were, uh, you know, there were, the older kids were regularly tying us to fence posts and beating us, <laughs> all the typical things you'd expect in the urban neighborhood. And then uh, we went out to the island. We moved to the island when I was six, and uh, we lived in a small house across the street from the municipal storage yard, and it was literally on the other side of the tracks. And uh, I grew, I, I, in those early years, I was just very embarrassed by my uh, by our lack of wealth. And, uh, and um, some... Flash forward, uh, I, I my parents were academics, and that provided a very rich, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, a, it was a privileged background in that sense. And high expectations. I had seven brothers and sisters. Um, you know, we uh, the typical uh, you know Irish Catholic family growing up in a working class neighborhood, and we had as our parents models to be the teachers. My parents were also dramatists and. Uh, we that ran through our family. A number of my siblings went on to careers in theater and new movies. And uh, anyway, uh, so I was always embarrassed in high school, and I was a I was a, kind of a troublemaker in high school. And uh, I like to think of myself as a contrarian now, but I was uh, back then they called it a troublemaker. 
and I barely got through high school. And then in, when I went into college, I decided I was going to be a good student. And then I, I was a good student and uh, had straight A's through college and graduate school. And then I went to the Peace Corps and taught uh, English literature at the University of Chad in Africa for two years. And then I came back and I got a job working for a small publishing company on a newsletter on African business and trade. And uh, took a trip to uh, Florida to visit my brother-in-law with my wife. And while I was there, I took three job interviews, two with newspapers and one with a publisher in Boca Raton of newsletters. And I, I surprised myself by having three job offers. And I, uh, I was on the I was in Key Largo, sitting on the shore, talking to a kid who reminded me of Sean Penn and Fast Times at Richmond High. And since I had three opportunities, I asked him what I should do. And he kind of looked up and uh, rolled his eyes and said, Boca, go Boca. And that's and so I went Boca. I chose that job. And uh, that that kind of changed my life because I was now working for a commercial publishing company. And uh uh, and six months later, I was head of their editorial department. Six months later, I took a Dale Carnegie course, and it was all about setting goals. And and uh, I remember one cha chapter said that uh, most people just don't set goals, and they're that's the, they're aimless, and that's the problem for most people. But some people have too many goals, and the problem is they can't choose; they can focus on one. And if you have this problem, this is going to be a tough test for you. And the test was to narrow your goals to 10 and then to three and then to one. And then for the next 14 weeks, because this was a 14 week program, we met once a week, you could only think about that one goal. And I, it was very dramatic to narrow it down to three goals. I finally got it down to teaching, writing, and getting rich. And uh, as I was walking up to the podium to announce my one goal, I was still torn. But then at the last moment, I had this thought, well, just make the money. And if you make a lot of money, if it comes true, you can always do those other things later on. And that turned out to be uh, exactly what happened in my career, more or less. But that decision to focus on the one goal of, of becoming rich uh, changed me entirely. Like the next day, I did almost everything differently than I was doing. I was no longer so concerned about uh, colons and semicolons and uh, making sure our, uh, my young readers read uh, elements of style. I was much more concerned with um, with the, uh, the success of our publications in terms of sales. And so uh, that rapidly changed. We, grew, we At that time, that business was just beginning and my partner and I grew it to about $135 million in, in about, I think about seven or eight years. And, um, and then, uh, I was involved in all kinds of other businesses and then Bill and uh, Bill Bonner and I got together when his business was about 8 million. And the next year we grew it to 25 and then over the next seven, six or seven years to hundred million. And then it stalled. And then we, we diversified the business and reinvigorated it and, and went well over a billion. And then we, we just, uh, one of our largest groups just went public. And so we're, that's where we are now. So that was very, uh, it all started with that decision to focus on that one goal of uh, developing wealth. Why do you think it is you've had a rich life in terms of not only your experiences in terms of uh, making money, uh, building your knowledge base, wisdom, writing, I think close to what, 20 something, 22, 25 books or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, what do you think is the biggest barrier to entry for most people from achieving their goals, or really, let's call it achieving whatever their definition of success is, what holds them back? Well, you know, I can only project my own experience on the experience of other people, but for me, certainly, it was this idea of I wanted so many things, uh, but I didn't really want to work very hard for any of them. You know, wanting things is pretty easy, and it's kind of, um, we're all kind of programmed to want all kinds of things. And I was willing to work hard, but, um, you know, generally hard, but working hard without a focus isn't going to really move the needle. And so I think that's probably true for, for people generally that we, you know, we want, 
we want our, our wealth to increase, certainly, but we want all kinds of other things that are as, as important or more important. We want good family relations. We want um, safety in our lives. We want, you know, not to, uh, we want to have friends and we want to uh, not, you know, get drunk and embarrass ourselves at parties. There's all kinds of things that that uh, occupy our daily lives. And um, and so I think it's that lack of clarity that is the, the first thing. Or, or just to put it differently, it's that, it's that there are so many things that are that we can do every day and so many little wishes and dreams that we might have and so many possibilities and they're all valid in their own way. So um, to me, it's the question is how can anybody ever focus on one thing with all those things? And, uh, and that's what changed me. Uh, I, I did that actually twice in my career, but um uh, and that making, you know, refocusing, and that made a huge difference uh, both times. So I would say that's the number one thing is that, uh, you know, if you're if you want to get wealthy and you want to do it on a kind of part time basis, um, there are things that you could do to be a better passive investor, to be a better, in, you know, half ass business person, but uh, you're not going to get big results without having uh, making you know, a real commitment and, uh, and doing things differently, you know? So, so you've seen, you've seen, uh, building businesses as you've built through the power of the pen, through marketing, through your just creativity and coming up with different, different angles, different ways of saying something that people were saying for so long, but you came with a different angle. Uh, you know, I, I look at some of your, some of your writings and it, you, you, it's, I don't think it's only your writings. It's all the creativity and thought that goes behind them. Uh, do you find that many people, they just sit and think and think and think and then write, or is it the opposite? They just write without any thinking. They just, they just, it's, it's just like, you know, literally just turning on the bathtub and letting it all flow out. Well, it's a good question. Um, I would say that as a coach of, of writers, and we're not talking about uh, fiction here, we're talking about you know, essays, basically, what uh, what used to be, you know, essays and letters. That's what we do in our industry. That's what people do. And even in video content, they're, they're more or less the same thing. Um, so it's nonfiction, and you're, you're trying to, um, to create an audience of however many. Uh, you have an idea of who you're talking to, and you want to get this person to... Um, to value what you have to say and to, and to, if not follow your suggestions, at least uh, be happy to receive them. Uh, and in that world, um, good writing to me is just good thinking. Um, and I, that's what it boils down to. The, the thought is what matters. And then, and then the writing, it's not the, the, the last, when people, when young writers often think that good writing is, uh, you know, a lot of adjectives and adverbs, and of course, that's the almost the opposite of good nonfiction writing, because if the thought itself is beautiful, uh, you don't want to put a lot of clothes on top of it, which is what, you know, all the, these adjectives and adverbs do. And so, um, you know, generally, I, I think that what good thinking is, is on any given topic, we want to listen to somebody who's kind of up to date on the topic and has is looking at it from a slightly different perspective. For example, I remember when I first started studying uh, libertarianism as a kind of a discipline or Austrian economics, but I remember libertarian in particular, there was one publication that came out with, it, it reviewed the daily news, but from a libertarian point of view. And I love to, I, I used to look at that every day because it was so helpful for me to learn, well, how does a libertarian feel about this? What is his ideas? And I think that's what, you know, what the world is quickly moving into all these communities where you have thought leaders who to be good, they need to know their su subject, but have a slightly different point of view, one that's not represented by the mainstream. And to do that, you know, you have to be, you have to be naturally a bit contrarian. You have to want not to have the same idea that I have a good friend that I put into this business. He's a good writer in the sense that he knows how to put together good sentences. But his whole thing is that he he likes to have the most conventional thought possible. And um, 
I loved him because when we would go out together, since I was never conventional, we would have great arguments. And uh, and I never noticed how conventional he was until I saw him when he was talking out to a, an audience that wasn't talking back. And uh, uh, you can imagine it was fun for me because he kept saying conventional things, you know, get me all riled up and then we would have some fun. So I do think that's that's the essence that you have to know your subject matter and have just a desire to have a different perspective um, you know, like you do in your writing, you know, you, you understand investing, you understand fundamental investing, you understand macro, and you have your own particular take on it. You don't want to, you're not going to be satisfied to be saying what everybody else is saying, or even what most of the other gurus are saying. And that's where the value comes in for the reader, I think. You know, I, I think one of the most important things that I've learned um, watching you and reading you and reading uh, Bill Bonner's uh, especially uh, one of the great essayists is that when you're writing, you have to have a focus in your mind of who you're writing to. And I find that so many uh, authors, so many uh, people who write essays, so many people who write newsletters, and really what, what I'm in the business in, a business of taking information that is complex and making it simple for my readers, my subscribers to understand in very plain talk, or I call real talk, of what's going on in the world. They don't want, mm -hmm. if they want to find out anything else, they can go to the Wall Street Journal or they can go on Yahoo Finance. So right. uh, what, what I see so many people write, and I read a lot of stuff, is they have no idea, you can tell by their writing, no idea who their avatar is, who they're writing to. Do you find that to be a big problem with most yeah, people? Yeah, I think it's a, very, it's a very important um, issue for writers, especially like you say, people in the digital publishing world, which is pretty much everybody, you have to know who your avatar is and uh, keep that in mind. Uh, you know, it's funny because for most of my career as a writer, which let's say started really in uh, seriously in 2000, 20 years ago, when I started to write Early to Rise. That was a, a, a publication for a digital publication for entrepreneurs, basically. And I was telling them everything I had learned about growing businesses, all kinds of businesses, from retail businesses to real estate to uh, publishing, you name it. And um, I, I just, my avatar back then was a young man. And I was surrounded by mostly young men, young women, some young women too, but mostly in my mind, it was a young guy. And so the way I wrote was kind of like a coach. And uh, it was a, you know, like a peppy, but no BS type of, you know, don't, you know, don't make any excuses, you know, you got to do the right tough thing. And, uh, and that, you know, at one time that, that um, blog had over 900,000 uh, followers or readers. And uh, obviously, all of them weren't of that kind. And and when I when I was writing to people outside, when people outside that group read the people that were too old to be coached, let's say, um, uh, they would you know they would write in and be upset with what I said. But uh, to that group, it worked it worked very well. But then uh, then when I wrote creating wealth, when I was writing, there was another ten years that went by. Um, it was. I kind of had the same avatar, but I was really talking to, I like more your audience, people that were um, more mature and in the middle of their earning career or towards the end of it, thinking about retirement. And so I started to like a change. The, the, I started to recognize I had to, and, and I had to give up that coaching thing, which I kind of enjoyed because you can't, and eventually I realized I was talking to people like right now, my own age. And I can't, my friends are not going to listen to me coaching them, yelling at them, saying, that's ridiculous. Although some of them have to put up with it. So uh, I've changed and um, it it makes you a, a better writer for sure. It's very challenging to uh, to write to the person that you're actually, your audience, you know, imagine who he is. And uh, yeah, I think that's important. And not only in, in the editorial side, but on the marketing side as well. Uh, so much copy that's out there is just like carnival barking and it's uh it's insulting to um they sound like uh, i call the carnies they sound like carnies yeah yeah you know, exactly you know I, I learned i learned this uh years ago maybe 15 or 20 years ago anything that i wrote anything this is before the internet even 
more than more than 20 years ago, I used to always write on top, dear mom. And I used mm -hmm. to write to my mother. And my mother was not an MIT. Someone says, well, your mother must be an MIT graduate. No, she wasn't. She was a, mm -hmm. uh, a housewife who had college, a high school education, never went to college. And I said, if I write anything that she can understand, I have to need to explain it. And I got mm -hmm. the idea from Warren Buffett. Every shareholder letter uh, that he is he he writes, he starts off within his own scratch on his own legal pad, uh, Dear Doris and Bertie, his two, his two sisters, who mm -hmm. are passive investors in his business, and his annual letter is something that he wants to keep them up to date on, on the business and their investments. And this letter, I, mean, I don't know if there's any other shareholder letter that is so anticipated and so weighted by the investing world uh, mm -hmm. that I used to sit and just keep pressing refresh to see when they posted it. And it's read mm -hmm. by young and old alike, experienced and inexperienced, life lessons. And it's said, and the man's a genius, but the simplicity mm -hmm. of it, as if he's writing to his sister. So uh, that's one thing that and when I read so much stuff out there, I just, who, is they, who are they writing dear to on top? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're very true. And of course, Buffett is the greatest example. And it's not just that he's writing with clarity so that his sisters who are non-professionals can understand. He's also writing with love. And uh, and that shows through, you know, that uh, you everybody feels like Buffett is their uncle, you know, their favorite uncle. And that and that comes from, you know, that caring about uh, your your ultimately your customer, your reader. Yeah. Yeah. I saw something that I want I want I want you to speak to, because I think this is really a, a sea change. I've never seen it. Uh, I'm, maybe you've seen it in your lifetime, but I never saw anything like this. November of 2021, we had a 3% quit rate. The U.S. Department of Labor never put in a quit rate, meaning people who left the job force, the labor market, they left, they just quit. Now, some of them left for reasons of health. They were concerned with COVID, some caring for family members, some caring for children, but a good percentage, I think around the number, I think it was, so it was three to 4 million out of this 10, 12 million that disappeared are going into their own businesses. And I started watching several years ago, business applications, which is EAN, the employee identification number, they chart this, of how many people, it's EAN, EIN is a basically a social security number for a business. The number of applications went through the roof in 2020, which was during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So now you have millions of people starting in an entrepreneurial way, their own businesses, leaving the rat race, leaving corporate America. Now they see they can do it. Mark, you had such experience. You're, an, in fact, outstanding communicator. If you had all these people in one room, what would you tell them? Well, first of all, uh, congratulations. Uh, in my book, uh, Entrepreneurs Are the Heroes of Society, uh, more than any other group. Uh, it's funny, a friend of mine who is from, let's say, a, a different perspective, a more leftist academic perspective, once sent me a book that explained why um, entrepreneurs are basically psychopaths or sociopaths, I forget. Um, but for me, you know, this is where, you know, all innovation and wealth comes from people that are willing to step out of uh, the role of uh, employees doing, you know, what they're supposed to be doing, which is perfectly fine to uh, trying to create um, uh, something new or, or some different, slightly different version of something that already exists. So what would I say to those people? I mean, I've written books, books for those people, uh, but I would say that, uh, that what you need to do first and foremost is understand the, the, the industry that you're going into. If you want to open a restaurant, you need to understand that or any kind of retail business that, the, you need to know the fundamentals. It's bull and chain, a business where you can't leave and you're dependent so much on your employees who are very hard to get now. And, um, and it's, it's a, in many ways, it's the toughest business as, and stay away from glamor. Anything that sounds like fun, which restaurants kind of do travel business, anything related to, uh, you know, movies, uh, all those businesses are terrible. There's so much competition. Uh, it's so unlikely that you as a, a newbie coming in are, are going to have, if you want to get involved in 
uh, in those businesses. Actually, here's here's a, a tip: spend a year or two and work for free if you have to for a business that is growing in the industry that you want to be in, and that will be like going to four graduate schools. And and what will happen is if if you are uh, the superstar person that you need to be to be successful in anything you're going to be noticed right away even if you're an intern within three months they're going to be offering you a position in the business and you're going to rise up very quickly the the key to that part of it if you go to apprentice yourself to someone else it's got to be a growing business a fast growing business because that's where all the opportunities for advancement and knowledge come of course if you do it the conventional way i would say go to an industry where um, there is a lot of growth already and go to a sector where there's a lot of growth, where the growth is relatively new, where the people that are competing are, are not, um, um, are still kind of learning like you will be and, uh, and find, uh, and, you know, and find a, a niche that you can, um, you can differentiate yourself with, you, you know, you, you all need that, uh, that little, um, well, I think Warren Buffett calls it a, uh, uh, a moat or something. We need this this one area that makes our business a little a little bit different that we can we can um, improve over the years, so that it's, it'll be hard for people eventually to compete with us. I've got look. I have so many uh, so much advice for new entrepreneurs. I've got about six books, but if anybody wants to. Uh, to start their own business, I would say the number one thing you have to read: Ready, Fire, Aim. It's it is the best book ever written on uh, on entrepreneurships, and I just happen to write it. And I can't tell you how many people that have 10, 15, 100 million dollar businesses say that they they uh, they did it following the blueprint of uh, Ready, Fire, Aim. So there there you go, an unsolicited uh, promotion for a book that I'm not even sure you can find on Amazon anymore. If you do, it probably be a hundred bucks. You know, you know, uh, it, I, I think that book came out, what, about uh, 06, 08, somewhere around there? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah I, I do yeah. remember reading it. I said, I looked at it, I thought it was a typo, you know, ready, fire, ready, uh, fire, oh, aim. Yeah. yeah, I looked at it, I said, yeah. and boy, it's going to probably maybe get it used at a cheaper <laughs> price. But when I read the book, you know, it, I, 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 you know, all this advice you gave was really spot on. And, you know, I've started several businesses and, and I was in money management and tough, tough businesses. And the differentiation and all that, 100% agree with everything. That I, I wish my first job, and I would have paid for it, was getting coffee for Warren Buffett. <laughs> I would, yeah. I would just would, oh, getting in this case uh, cherry right. co cherry coke. I, I would just, I, I, you know, just to be around smarter people than myself, and to learn. Yeah. And I was too, I was too smart for my own good because I didn't go to to an investment banking firm. I was a floor trader, and I started directly at 22, my own money management firm, and I thought I knew everything. And I'm just thinking yeah. back, if I would have done it, I would have worked for someone just to learn the industry, make contacts, but I did, but it all turned out yeah. okay. But there's one thing I just want to add on to what you were saying. And, I, and, I'm, and, and, I, and I'm seeing this in people who come to me for advice and, and suggestions. Uh, the one word I would give them is perseverance. It, it looks great. It looks like, you know, you look at the end of a yes. marathon run right. and the guy crossing is smiling sometimes and he right. crosses the thing, but boy, yeah. mile number seven sucked. <laughs> yeah. Mile number ten. Yeah. There's yeah. no way you're finishing. It's those. It's that. It's that. As you call ball and chain, that blocking and tackling. That every day you go and you don't even. And some days it's like one step forward, three steps back. Yes. And just getting yeah. out of bed in the morning. And I think that's one thing that I never lost sight of was that mm -hmm. it's a marathon, not a sprint. I, I just. I said, you know what? I, I'm in no. I'm in no hurry to get rich. It's going right. to come. But it, right. it, that's why I stayed away from doing stupid things that could have maybe you know, given me a shortcut. But right. uh, I think perseverance is something that most people don't have because after one smack in the face, they're down on the floor. They're done. You see that? Yeah. I agree with you 100%. Um, when, you, when you talk to people who've been very successful in business and you interview them and you ask them, what was their success secret? They always come up with, you know, politically correct answers. Oh, it's, you know, it's finding the right people. Oh, it's just lucky. And, and, uh, and you know what, when you look back on your, on your, your career, a successful career, it often does feel like lucky and, you know, just happening to meet the right people. But when you look forward, if you could go back in time and look forward, it's just 
perseverance. It's going every time. And this is, I always had this in my mind. I, I'm just like you. I wanted to be a turtle. I knew I wasn't lucky enough, smart enough, fast enough to be a hare. So every time I came into, I, I came upon an obstacle, I would say to myself, that when I felt like stopping, this is where I'm going to leave three or four people behind. I imagine myself in a race with a hundred people and every obstacle, three or four would give up. And now it would only be, it's like the squid game, you know, now it would only be uh, 96 people. Now it would be 89 people. And that's how I did it. You, you know, it thins out. And, you know, it's funny you say that because we have not spoken about this before and our, our career paths and life paths were totally different. I used to think of it in a similar way, thinking, okay, at this obstacle, it's going to knock out blank percent of the people. Therefore, if I just wake up the next morning and go into the office, I'm going to mm -hmm. be ahead of the game. And then when I saw yeah. an obstacle, uh, be it uh, some change of the law, the SEC, trading thing, I said, wait, I'm not the only guy having that problem. Half of the people are going to walk away and quit. A third mm -hmm. of them are going to try to take a shortcut, which is going to end in disaster. So now mm -hmm. the field just thinned down to me and a whole bunch of other people. You know what? As we keep moving along, we'll just keep thinning out the right. field. And, and, I've, yep. and, and you know, I, I, I love that you said that because every, I, I, used, I still look at every challenge as a way of thinning out the field. And number two, it just got me smarter because I'm going to figure this out. And that was the challenge to me that uh, yeah. th if that's going to knock everyone else out, I'm, I'm, there's no way I'm going to figure this out because 7.3 or 4 billion people on planet earth, they got to be a solution to this. <laughs> yes. And that's a very good point. That second point too, because um, I never felt, I always felt smart. You know, I never, I'm not going to pretend I didn't, uh, feel smart, but I definitely wasn't the smartest guy. I, you know, I, I went to a high school of, <laughs> in middle and Rockville Center and where it was filled with kids with 140 IQs. And, uh, but I always thought that I was smart. I was like, so smart. I, I was, I was smart enough that I could figure out the solution later. Nobody could see me. Sorry, but like back off. And, and that's, a, that's an, I had that same feeling like I'll be able to figure it out. You guys can do what you want. I'm going to figure it out. And three months from now, I'm going to have a solution that's going to be working. So, and that in itself is a, is a kind of persistence, right? It's a psychological tool that we use. So we say, so if an obstacle is nobody can figure out what to do, you don't panic, you don't give up. You say, I'm going to figure this out. It may take me a while, but I will. And when you come up to a, a problem, you say, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to come back tomorrow. 80% of the game is just showing up. Just showing up, yeah. The next day. What they should have said is showing up the next day. Yep. Because it's, it, you got to show up. It, it's the obstacles, the problem, which makes people stay home. Boy, and there were so many days I just did not want to get out of bed. And I said, staying in bed is a worse option. <laughs> yeah. So go yeah. up there and face it. And guess what? You know, you, you know I, I, we had this guy, uh, one of my father's friends. He passed away recently, uh, recently, about 10 years ago, recently. I guess as you get older, recent becomes yes, like, right. you could say a decade ago, it's yesterday. Mm -hmm. And he was, he worked in a luncheonette, really, really nice man. He worked in a luncheonette, counter man, uh, wake up at four in the morning, made the egg salad and all that. And his advice to me, every time he saw, saw me, because you know I love playing softball, was keep swinging. And, I, you know, I, I think like, why does he keep saying that? And then as time got on, I got older and he goes to me, you know, you're still swinging? I said, no, I don't really play that much. He goes, I never talked to you about softball. Mm -hmm. Just never stop swinging. And I said, boy, oh boy, that's so profound. Because you can't get out of a batting slump sitting in the dugout. You got to get that's up right. there and embarrass yourself. And right. if you don't swing, you're out of the game. I said, all right. 100%. Once in a that's while, so I'm going to hit a ball. So I just think of that so often. Just yeah, keep yeah. swinging. Yeah. Well, we've identified a third, uh, let's say, um, psychological frame to understand success from. I had that same experience. I, when I went down to work in Boca Raton and decided that I was going to have, you know, do everything I can to make the business successful, I, we had a, like a great year or so. And everything that I did worked fantastically. And I remember my boss, who later became my partner, gave me this little plaque and it said marketing genius on it. And I put it, you know, on the side of my desk and I would, felt so proud of that. And then about like a year later, six months later, everything I did stopped working and I had no idea why. And I used to come in and look at that thing 
And it, it was so embarrassing to me. You know, I think you're just, you just got lucky. You're a, you're a marketing dummy. Uh, you're a fraud, you're imposter syndrome. And it, it wasn't, you know, paranoia. I was proving it. I was putting together editorial, promotional marketing packages that were failing. And, um, and I, I, I talked to my, by then he was, I was his partner, junior partner. And I noticed, and he, you know, our business, because all the stuff was going through me. So it meant that he, he was failing too, in a way. But he wasn't like, uh, he wasn't depressed like I was about it. And uh, I, I asked him, he, he said, you know, he goes, Mark, I, I've been th through this before. He goes, just keep at it. Just keep at it. Something will happen. And I thought, well, what's going to happen? I don't have any new ideas. And, you know, I just kept at it. And all of a sudden things got better. And we went, we went from... I think then it was like $20 million all the way up to like $85 million in like two years. And, and I, I still don't know exactly what I did that was so different. So yeah, sometimes it's just, uh, it's just keeping at it. Yeah. You know, uh, keeping at it. Yeah. I, I, you know, I tell you, I've always looked to see what, what that was. And I, and I came up with, with one possible solution when I'm really, really good, I'm above the mean. When I'm really, really bad, I'm below the mean. Eventually, I'll be somewhere in the middle. And never mm -hmm. take myself to the point when, uh, when I'm the marketing genius, if you will. And I don't take my point of a marketing idiot, you know, or a trading idiot or investing idiot. I didn't take stupid pills. <laughs> I didn't take mm -hmm. genius pills. It's right. that mean that most, most of us all have. And it just really just kind of incrementally goes up. And it's like the duck taking credit for the pond rising. We take, you know, things work. And right. we had no, we had no impact on that. Right. It's just, and, and, and it works the other way. We don't, you know, we take it when it, when it works our way, something we had nothing to do with, we take full credit. Right. And when something uh, forces us back, we, we yeah. basically look and say, oh, we're just that much stupider. Nah, it's somewhere in the middle. And, and I think I take that out of Success has many parents, failure is an orphan. Lonely orphan. Yeah. 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 And, and it's, and, and I find, you know, we're just going back to that room. Cause I think about it often in the past year and a half of so many people going into the, their own business. And I think the, they're going to probably do all the things, market research and find out, do mm -hmm. demographics, uh, hire the right people, all, all that stuff. But that's the easy stuff. The hard stuff is when, you know, the lights go down, uh, all the, all the, all the, all the, all the, I don't know, the, 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 um, the excitement of opening your own place and having your name, that's all gone. And now it's just right. you gr grinding it out. And I find out that yeah. grinding out part, it, that's the like 11th mile in a marathon where you, no one sees you if you drop out. No one cares. Right. They kind of expect it. But that's right. the point that you just got to bear yeah. down and keep walking. Yeah. And your, your great ideas in business rarely come at 830 in the morning when you're having your first cup of coffee. They usually come from when you're in the middle of a family dinner and people <laughs> and they're talking about something you should be interested in. And suddenly it comes to you. And then your spouse looks at you like, what, why aren't you paying attention? And you, uh, you scribble it down and get back to the conversation. Yeah. So it's what you think about uh, always. Uh, I would say though, that the, uh, just jumping to the core message of Ready Fire Aim is the number one thing I would tell new entrepreneurs is that every business that you get involved in, every industry has a couple of secrets that, uh, that are responsible for success. And you can't know what those secrets are necessarily by studying the business from the outside, by reading about it. And you may not know from talking to people because they may not tell you. And some people don't even quite know that they're in the business. They don't know consciously, but they know subconsciously. This is how we always do things, they say. That's not a bad thing. They don't know why, but they're doing these things because it works. And so they're, what I'm saying is the, starting a business is a race between the money you have, the patience you have the willingness of other people to work with you and the goal of, of creating a break even at least cash flow. And you've got to, you've got to discover that invisible secret before you run out of money and patience. And if you don't, the business is gone. So forget about everything else. The only thing that matters is how can I sell a product to a customer at, at break even or better? That's the main thing that you want to focus on as an entrepreneur. Everything else is secondary. Forget about your business cards. Forget about filing all the forms that you have to file. All that stuff can be done later. Just focus on that initial sale.
Yeah, no, that single-minded purposeness of just getting that one thing. Uh, you know, I, I look back also at uh, in 1994, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos uh, with Amazon. It was that single-minded purpose of basically seeing a major trend, which was the internet, growing at an amazing, I think, 2,500% annual compounded growth. And he said, I got to get on this train. Uh, he figured out a product because uh, it's easy to ship. It was books. And, and he was... What people don't know about him, he was at D.E. Shaw. D.E. Shaw is a phenomenally brilliant uh, hedge fund, and they hired mm. quants, and there were quants before there were quants. And this guy was a genius. So for him to mm. find out, he spoke with um, with uh, with Shaw about leaving. Uh, I don't think Shaw wanted him to go, but he said, this is my idea. This is my dream. I'm doing it. And uh, to go from where he was to uh, working in, uh, 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 um, I think it was his garage. But the whole thing was is to to find out and, and, you know, you mentioned The Secret. I remember uh, reading, we had Brad Stone on, on the show a while back uh, who wrote the book, Unbound. He wrote two books on, uh, on uh, Amazon. And he said one of the secrets was when they're picking orders to get tables so they don't have to lean down and go on the floor. <laughs> Something as simple yeah. as that. You know, yeah. it, was, it was these little things that they kept perfecting. And, it, you know, success wasn't one thing a thousand percent better. It was a thousand things one percent better. And they kept right. building and yeah. it kept compounding and compounding and compounding. It was no secret. I remember at the time I kept saying, gosh, he's going to put Barnes & Noble out of business. <laughs> you know, they got to be crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, they have uh, 72% of online book sales now. Unbelievably, companies, you know, started in, in our lifetime. So it's not something that was a John D. Rockefeller and Warren Buffett said right. he is the greatest businessman of our generation. Uh, here's yeah. a guy who's leading in the cloud business as well, uh, which makes a heck of a lot more money than Amazon. And, uh, uh, you know, Amazon per se, uh, retail wise, but, and, and what it's done for society is absolutely amazing to get during the, during the pandemic, uh, it was their supply chain, their supply lines, they were the delivery that was getting right. medical supplies. What, what an impact on society. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, absolutely. It, yeah. My, I have a botanical garden. My brother-in-law lives in it and he always, <laughs> He always complains about UPS and all the other services, but you know they drop the stuff outside where he has to drive to pick it up. But Amazon somehow finds a way and drives it all the way to his his little house, which is in the middle of twenty five acres, and does it you know every morning. Wow! Well, so it's outstanding. amazing, yeah. outstanding. Uh, Mark Ford, the amazing Mark Ford, a Renaissance <laughs> man in our time, uh, author of twenty <laughs> plus books. Uh, you, you, uh, you also in art. I, I, I remember walking into your office. There's a piece of art there. You collect them. You, tr you. What do you do with art? You do. Yeah, something I'm, like I'm a collector of art, and uh, I'm also I have an art business, and I have a, I have a very, uh, I have a little scheme for um, dominating a corner of the art market that uh, we can talk about some other time. Wow, yeah. not on air, I guess. I guess. Wow, that's no, it. <laughs> I'll let you in here and we can talk about it. <laughs> wow, so I guess the trick to success is to join the Peace Corps. I guess, yeah, who knew? <laughs> who knew? Wow, amazing. Uh, Mark, continued success uh, and keep doing the great stuff. Keep keep writing. I hope you just, uh, just come up with new ideas and really write them. And your, your writing gets better over time. It, it's, uh, I guess that's just a matter of experience. Uh, why use you, you know three words Thank when you, two Tom. can do and uh, and just keep doing you know fighting the good fight and doing great things. Uh, Mark, hey, thanks. Charles, can I mention yes. that uh, people can follow me at markford.net? Absolutely, Mark Ford. I'm gonna I'm gonna put a link in the description to to your site as well as Ready Fire Aim if it's still available. Uh, but you still you write a blog, don't you? Write a daily blog? Yes, or? yeah, that's it's markford.net is my blog. Yeah, and 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 you write this every day. No, I write it three times a week, usually Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And who is the blog for? Everything under the sun. Who would you? Huh? Yeah, who would who would who would be the ideal um, uh, reader for you? Who would you? Who would you? Who are you writing to? You, I would say you. Um, it's not. I'm not coaching young entrepreneurs anymore, and I'm. You know, I'm 71 years old, so I'm not. I will write about building wealth and things I've written about for many years. Maybe one out of every four issues. Uh, I like to write about culture. I like to write about uh, social, political things, uh, uh, how to have a, a rich life. It's I would say uh, anybody that's at or nearing retirement might find it more enjoyable. I got a lot of uh, feedback from uh, friends and family members who are 
The most important thing you need to know is that um, I uh, I don't let hypocrisy uh, interfere with my writing. I I'm perfectly happy to recommend things I don't do personally. So uh, I do that for the love of my readers. Beautiful, beautiful, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Ford. Mark, thank you so much for being on the show. I, I really had a great time. I could speak to you for hours. In fact, when I come down and see you in Florida, I probably will speak to you for hours face to face. Thanks so much, That's Mark. Great. Thank you, Charles. A pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Charles Mizrahi Show. If you're a new listener, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, we're glad to have you back. Either way, we'd love to know what you think of the show. Please leave a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Reviews make it easier for others to find the show. You can also see the video of the interview on the Charles Mizrahi Show channel on YouTube.